Hello students and welcome to this exam review for Civi 261 Dynamics. Today we're going to be covering the Chapter 12 Particle Kinematics section of our textbook as a review for the upcoming exam. So beginning Chapter 12, right, Particle Kinematics, basically meaning particle motion. The motion we're talking about here essentially is relating the position, the velocity, and the acceleration of particles. Now as we think about particles, just to get a little more detail of what we're talking about the particle, um, particles can have mass, um, but particles have no dimension. They're basically so small that all that mass is packed into one little place. Now as far as particles having mass, that doesn't affect us too much here in Chapter 12 because we're not yet dealing with forces. We'll get into those in Chapter 13 and beyond. So realize that as we're relating our position, our velocity, and acceleration, fundamentally going down in this list we're taking time derivatives right the time derivative of position is velocity the time derivative of velocity is acceleration if you need to go the other direction basically going up from acceleration to velocity position we then take integrals now the reason I put added this little plus down here is don't forget uh, any constant that we have as we move up now realize that those constants have physical meaning if you take an integral of acceleration to end up with a velocity function time integral then our constant constant here in the velocity function will be the initial velocity. If you take an integral of the velocity function and end up with the position equation, the constant here will be the initial position. Okay, So those always have a physical meaning uh, besides just being an integration constant. We then in class work through the derivation, basically starting here with these basic equations over in this column. And by doing separation of variables and taking integrals, we kind of progressed through the columns here from left to right. Now realizing that these first two rows here incorporate time, the third row does not. So if you have a problem that doesn't ask you specifically about time, go ahead and jump down here to the third row and just think about how these equations might satisfy that overall problem. Now you're welcome to either always start here with the basic equations and then work through the calculus, or you're welcome to use any of these equations in their given form. All of these equations are included on your equation sheet. Do keep in mind that this final column over here is only for constant accelerations. Now constant means either constant with time or constant with position. So basically acceleration does not change over time or space. Now, continuing in chapter 12, we had all of these different calculus-based relationships. We're also able to basically graph calculus-based relationships. And so these letters here, A, B, C, and D, correspond um, to information in chapter, or excuse me, section 12.2 and 12.3 that basically shows the change in velocity is the area under the acceleration as a function of time graph. Right here's that change in velocity equals the integral of the acceleration function, and etc. Down through this list, um, do get a little practice just because it's not as intuitive as some of the other forms. In just dealing with C and D down here, they're not time-based relationships; they're actually uh, position-based relationships. And we did a little bit of this in our homework. So all of these equations that we've derived, we derive them really using just a one-dimensional framework. We said, well, if we have motion along a line and we're going to compute all these other terms, position, velocity, and acceleration along that single line, we then could just use these terms. But then, of course, not all motion happens in a one-dimensional framework. And so expanding that into a two-dimensional framework, we essentially got here into this second set on the, on the review sheet. So we had three different sections taking a look at motion with Cartesian coordinates, motion with tangent normal coordinates, and also motion with cylindrical coordinates. Now the type of coordinate system that you use is dictated by the type of motion that's happening. Often I think about that as the type of velocity and or acceleration that's being imposed on the problem. So our easiest type of motion, just because it's probably easiest just because it's the one we're most used to, is using this Cartesian XY coordinate system. Now the direction of X and the direction of Y never change. They never change in direction. Hence I hat and J hat, they don't change in magnitude. They also don't change 
in direction. And so this coordinate system is great if your acceleration terms also don't change. And so if the direction of your acceleration, and the biggest example here would be acceleration in the J hat, often if we line up our coordinate system that way, being gravitational acceleration, um, that we know that gravitational acceleration always is pulling down toward the center of the Earth. And we're, if we're in a limited spatial um, reference frame here on the surface of the Earth, basically ignoring the fact that we have curvature to the Earth and that gravity is actually um, changing in direction with the curvature of the Earth, we then can leave things and just, all right, everything's Cartesian, X and Y, Y is vertical, X is horizontal, and we run things that way. The only modification that we'll often make to these XY coordinate systems is if we have linear motion and we're solving that out with an XY coordinate system, we'll often rotate the coordinate system so that one of the axes lines up perfectly with the direction of motion in that problem. That way, 100% of the motion is in one direction, none of the motion is in the other direction, and it simplifies uh, some of our equations to solve through, basically not having components of velocity and acceleration um, in both the X and the Y direction. Next up, we started to focus on tangent normal coordinates. Now, tangent normal coordinates is taking a look at the motion or acceleration expressed along a curved line. Right, So now instead of our coordinate system never changing in direction, we're defining tangent being in the direction of motion, normal being perpendicular to the tangent towards the center of curvature, and that this coordinate system will be moving with the, with the particle. Okay, so as the particle moves, that coordinate system moves with it. Still 100% of our velocity is going to be in this tangent direction. Now in the notes in class, I express this unit vector here as a t hat. Um, we also, using the arc length function, could express this as the radius times the angular velocity, basically, of that radial line, also in the t hat direction, in that tangent direction. But because we have both a change in magnitude of velocity, also a change now in the direction of velocity, we ended up with an additional acceleration term. Okay, the additional acceleration term is our normal acceleration. Normal ac acceleration is expressed as the time rate of change of the direction of the tangential um, axis system, basically. Or you can think of it, uh, the time rate of change in the direction of the unit vector in the tangent axis direction. The most common form we have for that is v squared over rho. That's the one that we use probably 90 plus percent of the time. But also note, if you have things expressed in terms of the angular velocity, in this case it's written as beta dot, that we can have these other equivalent forms. These all have the same units. It'll be a length per time squared, no matter which of these um, normal acceleration terms you use. Now, the best litmus test that we have on whether normal acceleration exists or not is what does the path of the particle look like? If it's a linear path, the acceleration in the normal direction will equal zero because there's no time rate of change of the direction of the tangent axes. But if it's a curved path, it doesn't matter if it's constant velocity along that curved path, changing velocity, it will always have a normal acceleration due to that curved path and needing an acceleration basically to push the particle um, into that path. Otherwise, it would shoot off at a tangent line. We have one additional equation here that we use basically to find the curvature of any line. So this isn't an equation that's specific just to tangent normal. It's just because we're dealing typically with curved paths. If you have a curved path that's expressed by a function, basically a function of y is a function of x, then we can apply this equation to solve for the local radius of curvature at the location um, x, wherever this, this particle is. So note that these are derivatives. These now are dy dx derivatives. So derivatives of this equation, of this function with respect to x. Uh, a single derivative in the top, the second derivative in the bottom. Note that the second derivative in the bottom is the absolute value of that second derivative. And so if the second derivative came out to be negative, you just change it to a positive. Uh, in the top, it's kind of the same thing because you end up squaring that first derivative. And so they end up both being um, instantaneous values of the first and second derivative um, at the location x. Then the last coordinate system that we got into was cylindrical coordinates. Now, cylindrical coordinates are expressing motion in systems that basically rotate around one single point. And so there's some kind of a position vector r that comes out from a single point. Now, here we define r as going in the direction of our 
our vector, right? Our position vector from that fixed point um, of reference out to our particle location and continuing out in that direction. Theta will always be expressed in direction perpendicular to R and going in the direction of motion. And so we talked about that if we have circular motion, then the tangent normal and the cylindrical coordinates kind of collapse onto one another. The only difference is that the normal axes in tangent normal and the r axes in um, cylindrical or r theta are going in opposite directions. It turns out that theta and tangent are going in perfectly the same direction, which is the direction of motion. And so these terms got a little bit more complicated because no longer are one of the axes system or one of the axes lined up with the direction of particle, they're actually more reference to the origin point, the reference point in the system. So now we both can have a time rate of change of that position vector, basically looking at how quickly something is moving um, in or out away from this origin point. And then the other term that we have is how is r times theta dot, which once again is using that arc length function, looking at basically the velocity perpendicular to this vector, dependent upon what the angular velocity of this vector is. Okay, so that's assuming once again that this is my position vector r. Our equation again then got a little bit more complicated as we took the time rate of change of this velocity, things kind of expanded out. And the reason they expanded out is because of the product rule in uh, calculus. And so if we have two different vectors that both can change in magnitude and or direction, we then have to take the product rule of those. And in this case over here on the right hand side in the theta direction, we have three different terms, r, theta dot, and also the unit vector in the direction of theta here written as e hat theta, all three of those can change with time. And so by expanding all those out, the derivation is in your book, and then collecting terms back in, isolating those terms in the r direction, we end up with r double dot, so the time rate of change of this, of so excuse me, the time rate of change of the radial velocity, it's the second time derivative of this radial position, minus r times theta dot squared, all of that in the r direction, plus r times theta double dot, once again, a term that comes um, from the arc length function, if theta double dot is the time rate of change of the angular velocity, uh, it's the second time derivative of the um, radial position theta. So that times r gives you a um, acceleration perpendicular um, to this r vector. And then additionally, collecting terms, a 2r dot times theta dot. Okay, so not expecting you to memorize that entire equation, it is on your equation sheet. But we just plug in all the non-zero values to compute how much acceleration in the r direction, how much acceleration in the theta direction. So as you study for your exam, beyond just learning how to operate across these three coordinate systems, I would encourage you to make sure that you can differentiate what kinds of problems we solve in one coordinate system versus what kind of problems we solve in another. As you've been asked the questions during class, um, associated with the sections that are on each coordinate system, it's been pretty obvious uh, which one to use. But um, you know, including that uh, learning exercise that I gave you that gave you the eight different problems to take a look at and select the best coordinate system to solve each problem with. Um, and it looked like in there that most people struggled with differentiating when they'd use tangent normal and cylindrical. So make sure that you set up enough problems that you have a solid understanding of when to use one versus the other. All right, the last two sections in chapter 12, 12.9, which was, I guess these are actually in opposite order, 12.9, um, which is constrained motion, and 12.10, which is relative motion, are are different but related to the previous topics. We actually, on both of these sections, both 12.9 and 12.10, will use mainly a Cartesian coordinate system. And the reason that we use that is because we don't want a coordinate system that's moving with particles. We want a coordinate system that is just locked in place. And no matter which particle you're looking at, where it is in space, we're using the exact same coordinate system to reference that particle, whether it's its position, its velocity, or its acceleration. And so the, so the Cartesian coordinate system um, fits that bill. Now, there are two different ways to solve problems in constrained motion. 
depending on which semester you've taken this class, we may or may not have covered both of these. Um, but essentially, one of the ways to solve is to write an equation for the length of each cable. And uh, that total equation basically is starting at the roof and working all the way around the whole thing. Fundamentally, the length of each cable won't work. Now, as you're drawing coordinate systems for that kind of computation, it's easiest if you basically draw horizontal reference lines. In this case, nothing above this line would change in length. And so this could become our datum. And we always want to measure things away from fixed points. Now, away from fixed points can also include for horizontal pulleys that this pulley here is not moving. So we measure things away from this fixed point. So y sub a would be going out this direction, whereas the distance down to the center of this pulley here, y sub b, would be coming downwards. So just away from fixed points. Uh, we can include any of this extra length. Now, I call it extra length. It's really length that isn't changing with time. So it would be this section here around the bottom of this pulley, top of this pulley, actually the full distance from here down to here, because both these roof and floor are not changing in location, all the way here to this red line. Uh, we just call those often in our equation just some constant length. Make sure to include that in your length equation. Then as you take your DL, DT, your time derivative of the length, um, there will be no time rate of change of that portion of the length. And so that term or those pieces will go to zero. Then you end up with um, one equation for each one of your cables. In this case, there's one single cable. So hence would have one L equation. If you have multiple cables, you'll have multiple L equations and work through those equations to find the ratio of your desired velocities. Once you have that ratio of your desired velocities, it's the exact same ratio um, for also the position and the acceleration um, beyond just the velocity. And so I uh, can work through that. The other way to work through these problems, which is based upon a topic that we'll get into in chapter 16, is using instantaneous centers of zero velocity. This does require that you have some kind of basic understanding of what is an instantaneous center of zero velocity. It functions like an instantaneous um, point of fixed axis rotation, that the body is moving around that point. We can find some of these by observation. For example, on this problem, a couple of ICZVs that we could identify. We know this cable over here is not moving at the ceiling, right? So there's a point of zero velocity right there. And because this cable is not stretching, we can also then make an assumption that uh, there's a point of instantaneous center of zero velocity right here. The other point that we could identify would be the center here of this top pulley. And that's just because it's a point of fixed axis rotation around that point. And you can see in the diagram over here to the right, those two points have been labeled as ICZVs. In addition to um, this bottom point down here, once again, a pulley and fixed axis rotation. So once you have that information, then you essentially work through some of the ICZV rules. Um, one of those is if you know two points of velocity on a body, you can draw these lines tip to tip and tail to tail. So here's the tip to tip, here's the tail to tail, and those two lines will intersect at the ICZV. It's really quite easy to see here for fixed axis rotation pulleys because that point's always in the middle. So all a, all a pulley and fixed axis rotation basically that's not translating up and down is doing is changing the direction of these velocities and then as you work through it you just start with some kind of a fundamental assumption um, what direction in this case I started probably here with the velocity of b going downwards drawing my tip to tip and tail to tail I saw at the far side over here I had to be moving at 2 vb once again that rope doesn't stretch coming up here to this side of the pulley also moving at 2 vb this pulley changes its direction this velocity was going up this one is coming or excuse me this velocity is going down this one's coming up once again ropes don't stretch in these examples and so this is also going up um, and basically kind of moving around this ICZV down here on the bottom and then we end up with our ratio of two to one um, as it relates to ICZVs It is your choice on exams which technique you use to solve these constrained motion problems. The last section we had in chapter 12 was relative motion. This came out of section 1210. And what we're doing here is we're laying the baseline of a understanding that we'll use really throughout the whole rest of class. And that is that we're not always measuring motion from a point that's not moving 
Sometimes we're measuring motion from a point that is moving, and we can consider that motion then relative to the moving point. And so the idea here is, is if you are in this boat and there's a plane flying overhead with this velocity right here, as you watch the velocity of that plane, um, which is basically the velocity of A relative to B, relative to this moving reference system, while the absolute velocity of the plane is going here up to the right, the relative velocity due to your boat also moving to the right um, is going to be basically going up and back to the left. Okay, and so we have an equation we can use for this. You can either use the difference of the two absolute velocities, um, but this relative velocity here is really the star. Once you can figure out exactly what that term is and what point is relative to another point, write this term, you know that um, whatever's on the left-hand side of this slash, of this relative slash, you'll add to that relative velocity. Whatever on the left-hand side um, will be over here on the left-hand side of the equal sign, right? So you can see the order here, A equals um, B plus, and here's the A slash B. So always in that order. If you flip the order of these, you have to flip these two terms on either side of the equation. It's the exact same equation uh, form for acceleration. We actually don't need to add any extra terms. This also gets back into that whole idea of dealing with Cartesian coordinate systems that we have these same relationships between velocity and acceleration. Um, but do keep in mind that if either of the particles, either of the bodies that you're looking at, or um, fluids, if there might be fluids in the problem um, are moving in a curved path they can have both a tangent and a normal acceleration and the tangent normal would show up in any one of these terms you may have an absolute motion in a curved path then you'll have both a tangent and a normal say here for point a if you had uh, point b moving in a curved path you could have both a tangent and a normal acceleration for point b you also could have a tangent and a normal relative um, here in the acceleration of A relative to B. And so you can have multiple components that will show up. Now, as we're taking a look at the motion of multiple particles, even though if we have some of these motion in tangent and normal, we're always going to push these problems in relative motion back to a Cartesian XY coordinate system. The reason for that is our Cartesian XY coordinate system does not change, uh, does not move with the particle. So another way I could say that is that the tangent normal coordinate system, say here of this plane, right, the tangent would be coming up this way, is not the same as the tangent normal coordinate system for this boat, where the tangent would be coming out this way. If we took the two tangent terms, whether it was velocity or acceleration, added them together, if we didn't bring them into a reconciling coordinate system first, we would not get the right answer. So we'll bring those both into XY, then add them together, and then everything's right in the world. So once again, two absolute and one relative term in each one of these equations. Keep in mind when you're dealing with any kind of moving fluids, um, water, air, anything else of the sort, um, sometimes it may be easier for you to envision a particle moving in that fluid. So kind of a particle with neutral buoyancy. So say a balloon that's floating with wind or a, um, a boat or an inner tube or an orange or something that's floating with fluids uh, might help you envision basically the relative terms in the overall problem. So that concludes my review of chapter 12 in CV 261 Dynamics. Um, I wish you all the best on the upcoming exam.